I was with my younger kids, and, and my kids at a particular age, they wanted to touch everything in the store. And so uh, I remember one time we were with Cameron, and he was at that age, he wanted to just absolutely grab everything. And I, I was getting so frustrated with it, I finally went up to him and said, Cameron, if you keep touching these things, I'm going to cut your fingers off. He just was like, looked at me totally mortified and ran to his mother and uh, said, Dad said he's going to cut my fingers off. And I just had to say, oh, yeah, there was a good parenting moment for me. Uh, every year at Christmas time, we try to be really intentional with the Jesse tree. Um, sometimes we would crash through like six or seven of them in one night instead of the beautiful time where you sit down every night and you read one piece of scripture. Um, I started bribing my kids with candy instead of the actual Jesse tree. Um, sometimes we'd finish it the week after Christmas. Um, this year we didn't even put it up. Okay, when I was growing up um, and they would pass the offering plate by, my parents would give all of us kids some change. And what I would do is I would take the change and I would just stick it in my pocket. Um, and they never found out, so... Good morning, everyone. I actually used to do the same exact thing as Hope, except I would hide the dollar bill my grandma would give me in the hymn books um, until after service. So that's how I made my piggy bank money. Um, my name is Andrea DeCook. I am the director of BASIC, like Jeff said. Uh, BASIC is our college and young adult ministry here at Orchard. We meet right here every Thursday evening at 8 p.m. Um, and I know I'm a new face on Sunday morning, so I want to tell you a little bit about myself so you can get to know me. I am originally from Fort Dodge, Iowa. I grew up there with my mom and dad and a younger sister and an older brother, so I am the middle child. It shows. Um, and then I moved to Cedar Falls in 2012 to attend UNI where I earned my BA in English. So I just read a lot of books um, and read a lot of papers. And then after I graduated, I had no clue what I was gonna do with my life. So I ended up staying here in the Cedar Valley to work at a nonprofit full time. And during that time, I also volunteered for BASIC. Um, which is where I grew a passion for theology and discipleship and then decided I should attend seminary. So in 2019, I moved to the suburbs of Chicago to work at Northern Seminary as an admissions counselor and a um, registrar for our master's and doctoral students, and I also earned my own master's of divinity. And then two months after moving there, I met my now husband, Ken. At the time, he was working as a youth and family pastor at one of our uh, local churches there. And it wasn't long after we started dating that the pandemic, pandemic hit in Illinois, like shut down completely. Um, we could only go to the grocery store or outside on walks for about seven months. So that was how we spent our first few months dating. And I think I knew it was love when together we had to live stream middle school and high school ministry from my living room. We did that every Wednesday and Sunday night and still liked being around each other. Um, so then in September of 2021, we got married. And then this past June, we moved back here so I could work with BASIC. And Ken now, actually, he just started two weeks ago as the um, next gen director at the Waverly campus. So we both are working here at Orchard full time and enjoying it. But we're also gonna be spending a lot of time together now. So if you could pray for that, that'd be great. Um, this morning we are ending our series on intentional families. And this topic actually comes up more than I would expect it to with our young adults. Did you know that a lot of our young adults at BASIC are struggling with learning how to become an adult that also has parents? Right, that's so interesting. A lot of the time, we talk about how our children grow up and they become adults and how it's so hard to be a parent with adult children, but we really think about it on the other end. Our young adults are figuring out how to be independent, but still respect their parents' opinions. They're navigating, um, making their own decisions, but still relying on their parents for some financial support. It's a weird and tricky relationship to, to navigate. And on top of all of that, they're learning how important it is to be intentional in those family relationships. Before young adulthood, they were just kids. They didn't have to go out of their way to spend time with their parents because their parents were just right there all the time, taking them to their activities, yelling at them that dinner's ready, making them wake up so they don't miss the bus. They were always right there. And same with their siblings. They lived in the room next door or shared a room or they were trying their best to not be around their siblings. But now, they're maybe out on their own, exploring the world as an adult, and figuring out that those relationships aren't convenient anymore. And maybe we're like that too. Maybe sometimes we wake up one day and are like, oh, it's been a month since I texted my brother. Or maybe you keep pushing visiting grandma off to next week. 
It's easy to coast through our relationships when we aren't intentional about spending time with our people. Coasting happens when we allow the business and routine of life to distract us from the people we love the most. But Jesus didn't coast through relationships. Despite the chaos unfolding around him, despite miracles to attend to and an agenda that would literally change the world, he still set aside time to be with his people. And we're going to look at a few specific ways he did that this morning. We're going to look at how Jesus showed up, how he met his people's needs, and how he led with grace. One of my favorite gospel stories is a great example of how he did all three of these things. So this morning, we're going to jump in to John 21. And I want you to imagine this scene with me. In John 21, we find the disciples out for a night of fishing, right after the one they gave up everything for was crucified, right after they were cowards and left him at the cross. And though the risen Christ appeared once to them already, they were still figuring out what their lives were supposed to look like now. They gave up everything for this man, and now they're confused and not sure what is coming next. So they spend a whole night out fishing, and to make matters more depressing, they caught nothing. And then some guy on the beach rubs it in their face by asking what they caught. Can you imagine their faces when they have to say, nothing? And when they told this person that they had nothing, he told them to throw their nets over the boat once again. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net because their catch was too large. And it was at this point they realized this man on the beach was Jesus. So we're going to jump in at John 21, 7. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus showing up here baffles me for a couple of reasons. The first, why did Peter put his outer garments on before jumping in the water? If you know why he got more dressed before going into the ocean, please let me know, because seminary didn't tell me that one, and it confuses me every single time. But also, the second, the zeal Peter had at seeing Jesus astonishes me, because if I was Peter, I might be feeling afraid, ashamed, or even embarrassed. If you remember, before Jesus was crucified, Peter denied him three times. Their relationship was not on the best of terms, yet Jesus showed up and Peter was joyful. Jesus did not wait for Peter to apologize. He did not wait for Peter to explain or beg for forgiveness. He just showed up anyway. Can you imagine the impact that might have on your relationships with your family or closest friends if we just showed up? We didn't wait for them to apologize to us or pay us back or walk on broken glass to show us how sorry they were for this or that. Despite the tension that could come between us, what if we just showed up during the good times and the not so good times? But we could just coast, right? It doesn't take energy or time and we can stay in our routine of life. But instead of coasting, we could choose to be intentional by showing up. I have three nieces and a nephew. They're all siblings, seven and under. There's a lot of chaos going on in their house. But luckily, they have a lot of people that love them. They're their only grandkids on both sides of their family, and they have nine aunts and uncles. And their people show up. I went to Fort Dodge a few weekends ago to attend my niece's basketball game. It's the kind of game where they only use a quarter of the court, so not even half the court, just one hoop, and they don't keep score yet but she had seven adults there to watch her. We took up half the stands for this peewee basketball game, and she didn't bat an eye. She thought it was normal. Some people call her spoiled, but I think she just feels loved. But in actuality, there was a lot of pain and tension between some of us that were there to support her. There was a lot of real hard life going on that caused our relationships to be strained. But we showed up anyway, because how wonderful would it be if my niece grows up and thinks it's normal to just love each other through the pain. 
Showing up is not easy, but I think showing up is most important when it's hard. Some of us in this room this morning have been deeply hurt by someone we love, and the thought of showing up to that person is imaginable. But you're not alone in that pain. Jesus is walking with you through it. Jesus feels the pain and doesn't ask you to dismiss it. When Jesus showed up to Peter, he didn't dismiss the hurt Peter caused. He didn't brush it under the rug. He showed up despite the hurt in order to move the relationship forward. If we don't show up and decide to live in the tension, then we risk missing out on the incredible joy and gift God has waiting for us in our relationships. Might we get hurt? Yeah. Might our pride get bruised? Yes. But is it worth it? Yes. But I want to be clear. I'm not saying keep showing up for someone who breaks you down, who destroys your soul, who wants to hurt you because they are hurting. Do not stay in any kind of relationship that is not safe. God doesn't want you to be in harm's way, whether that's physically or emotionally. And if you need help discerning if it's time for you to remove yourself from our situation and how to do so, please reach out to our staff team at Orchard and we'll help you out. But know this, it's okay and necessary to put up boundaries when a relationship is doing harm to us. But for those people we're still called to invest in, those who are part of our lives, whether we choose them or not, show up to them. Show up physically by attending their peewee basketball games. Show up with a coffee in hand for your friend who was a new mom. Show up by driving your friend to their first therapy appointment when they're nervous. Show up to your grandkid's band concert even though their blue hair and nose ring makes you cringe. We are called to be intentional by showing up and being present in the lives of our family and friends. So, Jesus calls us to show up, but he also calls us to meet the needs of our people. When the disciples came to shore after the night of fishing, they were greeted with fire and fish being cooked and bread, ready for them to eat. I know when I show up somewhere and the food's already ready, it's the best feeling in the world. Jesus had the simplest of meals and a warm fire ready for them. He never brought his friends and family to fancy palaces or demanded that they were given the finest of things. He just made them feel seen and wanted. In the same way, we're called to be intentional about the spaces and the moments we create for our people. Or we could coast, right? That doesn't take energy. We don't have to get away from our life, business, and our routine. But we could be intentional by meeting the needs and creating spaces for our people like Jesus did. I know my space is a touchy subject. A not-so-fun fact about me is I have an almost unhealthy obsession with keeping my house clean. Since getting married, I've gotten better because I have to live with Ken's little messes that he makes. But if I know company's coming over, then the monster within starts to come out and Ken has to get out of the way. I get the vacuum out and try to futilely get the dog hair off every surface in my home. I bleach the guest bathroom, I get all the dishes clean, light all the candles, and try to make it look like no one actually lives there. Do you know anyone like that? Are you that person? I need all the shoes put away. The pillows on the couch have to be fluffed so no one actually knows that we sit on it. And absolutely zero crumbs, because people can't know we eat, ever. But what Jesus modeled, and what I'm learning, is that preparing a space for our people is more about making them feel like they belong, rather than a space that looks like a magazine cover. These are two very different things. Before Ken and I met, he had grown close to a couple at his church in Illinois. Paul was a volunteer with his youth group, and Sherry would show up on Sunday mornings with the biggest of hugs for Ken. Currently, Ken loves to cook. He makes all of our meals. But back then, he was a bachelor youth group leader who lived off Oreos and Taco Bell. So Paul took it upon himself to try to teach Ken how to cook, even though Paul himself didn't know how to cook that well. About once a month, Ken would go over to Paul and Sherry's house where Sherry, who was actually the chef of the family, would just sit back and watch those two do whatever they could in the kitchen to experiment and make something edible. Sometimes the food was actually really good. Sometimes it was burnt so badly they had to throw out the entire pan. There's a story to this day about a wok pan that they had to get rid of. I hear about it endlessly. Their house wasn't anything special, and they didn't make it look spotless or even pause the rest of their lives on Ken's behalf. They'd go about doing their chores, family members would come in and out of the house, and Ken would just be there with them. Ken, who didn't have any blood relatives nearby, felt like he had a home to go to and people who cared about him. He felt seen 
known, and welcomed. Preparing intentional spaces is more about how we can provide a space to connect and meet the needs of those we love than it is about making everything perfect. Jesus was intentional about nourishing the bodies and souls of his friends by providing a fire to keep them warm and simple food and a place for them to gather. Intentionality means that we put thought and time into what we're doing. Being intentional by preparing a space for someone means we're considering who they are and what they need, paying attention to the details of our relationship with them more than the distractions around us, paying attention more to what will make them feel at home and less to what we can do to impress them. This looks different from person to person. In our house, being intentional about spaces means that I set up my computer or my book or whatever it is I'm doing in the kitchen so that while Ken cooks us dinner, we can catch up and spend time together and decompress from our day. It also looks like brewing extra coffee if my grandma's coming to visit because it could be 9 a.m. or 9 p.m. and she'll have some. Maybe for you, this looks like setting an extra plate at the table and inviting your single friend over for family dinner. It could look like going on a drive with an old friend and listening to music and watching the sunset, or creating a bonfire in your backyard and inviting your neighbors over who you barely know even though they live a few feet away. We're intentional about our spaces so that we can be intentional about our relationships. The spaces we are in, the environments we create are tools we use to meet the physical and spiritual needs of the people in our lives. Whether they need a place that feels like home or a meal of fish and bread after a long night of working. We have the ability to be intentional using our spaces to invest in our relationships. So Jesus showed up, he met the needs of his people, and he led with grace. The very next section of scripture is a conversation between Jesus and Peter, a very important one. It's so big that when I study the scripture, sometimes I wonder why Jesus would waste time with breakfast. But now I know it was because Jesus wanted to lead with grace. After they finished eating, Jesus asked Peter if he loved him. Can you imagine that, Jesus asking you if you, if you love him? He asked this question three times, then calls Peter to take care of his sheep. This is huge. Peter, who denied Jesus three times when Jesus needed him the most, was asked to lead the beginning of the church. That's what Jesus meant when he said, feed my sheep. He was calling Peter to care for his people, the people of the church. This question, Peter, do you love me? Doesn't that feel gentle? I imagine it maybe as a whisper. Peter, do you love me? Isn't that question so different from, Peter, how could you deny me when I needed you the most? How could you hurt me like that? He would have approached Peter out of anger, spite, frustration, but he didn't. He approached Peter with gentleness and grace. How rare is that? How often are we able to approach our relationships in that same manner? This was a huge conversation, vital for the future of all Christians. Yet this chat with Peter was not the first thing on Jesus' mind. This is indicative of how Jesus viewed all relationships. He wasn't concerned about calling Peter's wrongs out. He was concerned about making sure that despite the wrongs, Peter still knew he was loved and wanted. What if we thought about relationships with our most treasured people like this? What if it was less about the rights and wrongs and more about loving our people unconditionally? Now, of course, we can choose to coast, right? It doesn't take energy or time from our day. It doesn't make us swallow our pride at all. But what if instead of coasting, we chose to be intentional by leading with grace in every conversation, even the most painful? I spend a lot of my time sitting with young adults as they talk through their family dynamics. And often, when they start sharing the messy parts of me, the thing they are waiting for me to tell them is that they are right and their parent is wrong, or their grandparent's wrong, their roommate is wrong, their best friend is wrong, whoever is wrong and they are right. Maybe you've had a conversation with someone like this, or maybe you're even willing to admit that you are that person seeking validation. When relationships are messy, we desperately want to be the one who is right. 
but how often has being right made that relationship better? How often does being right get rid of the tension and pain in that relationship? When we approach our relationships with the goal of being right, we stop seeing the other person. All we see is whatever is in the way of our agenda. But Jesus, he saw Peter first. He showed up and met Peter's needs. He made it a point to show Peter love before entering into a hard conversation. And when time for that conversation came, Jesus wasn't seeking a win for himself. He was still putting Peter first. How revolutionary would that be if instead of seeking a win, we sought to approach our people with grace and love? If instead of asking, how could you do that to me? Or what were you thinking? We asked, do you know I still love you? How would that change the trajectory of our hardest conversations? So showing up, meeting needs, loving first, these are not brand new revolutionary ideas. And I'm sure you've heard them before in a book or countless other teachings on this stage. But that's okay. Our goal today, this morning, is not necessarily to learn these for the first time, but to remember how important it is to be intentional with these. Because as we leave here today, our lives are gonna continue. We'll get on the phone, we'll have texts and emails, we'll bicker over if we wanna go to Culver's or get pizza for lunch, whose turn it is to take the dog on a walk, and we'll start thinking about packing lunches for tomorrow and when to get groceries to beat the Sunday rush. Life will begin to distract us, and it will be easy to forget to be intentional. It will be easy to coast through our relationships. So this is just a nudge to prioritize those small moments. For me, this looks like as peewee basketball games have just ended, starting to look at the softball and baseball schedules. I'm also gonna pick up the phone and not text to check in with some of my closest friends who, when I thought I'd move back to Iowa, we would see each other more often and we just haven't. Maybe for you, this is like, looks like swinging by the senior living center on your way home from work to finally visit grandma this week. Maybe it looks like calling your brother who you've accidentally gone a month without speaking to. What does it look like for you to show up for one person today? Ken and I lead a young adult small group and we challenged them a few weeks ago to think of just one person, one name that they can reach out to and be a blessing to or show up for. So who's that gonna be for you for this week? How can you love them by meeting their needs? Who do you need to approach with grace and gentleness? Jesus is yearning for each of us to see, really see our people. What do you need to do to make that happen? Will you pray with me? God, uh, thank you for bringing us together in this space today to be your church, to be your body of believers and be your people. Thank you for giving us a space to worship you and to praise you and to learn about you. And Lord, I pray um, as we leave here today that we um, can see our people the way that you see them, that we can see what it is that they need to flourish, what it is that we can provide them um, in our spaces or how we can show up for them in a new, unique way, Lord. I pray for little nudges from you, Lord, um, little reminders to be intentional throughout our week. We love you and we need you. Amen.